So I'd like now to introduce today's webinar speaker and presenter. Uh, Lila June, uh, Dene Sitsisas, will discuss native food systems in pre-Columbian times. Through her doctoral work, she has seen that a common denominator in these systems is the strategy of habitat expansion. Whether it's burning grasslands to maintain habitat for deer, buffalo, antelope, and so forth, or building intertidal rock walls to catch sediment for clam habitat, Native people have a knack for building a home for their food in reciprocal relationships. Through this maintenance of the home of edible plants and animals, whom they see as relatives, food can come through consensual and respectful relationships. Uh, now, Lila June uh, is an indigenous musician, scholar, and community organizer of Diné and Sisistas, that's Cheyenne, uh, and European lineages. Her dynamic multi-genre presentation style has engaged audiences across the globe towards personal, collective, and ecological healing. Uh, she blends studies in human ecology at Stanford, graduate work in indigenous pedagogy, and the traditional worldview she grew up with to inform her music, perspectives, and solutions. She is currently pursuing her doctoral degree focusing on indigenous food systems revitalization. So I think you're all in for a real treat here, and I will just put in a plug and say you should look for uh, Lila June's website uh, if you'd like to see some of her music. I think you can follow her on SoundCloud as well. So I am going to stop my screen share at this point, and uh, we'll go over to Lila June. Yeah, it's a eh. hello everyone. Um, very happy to be here. Um, yeah, I'll just get right into it. Yeah, eh so um i just said you know greetings my my kin and my people my grandmothers taught me to see every person as my people no matter what skin color they had or what language they spoke or where they were from and I um, am from the Nanish Ejitachitni clan of the Diné Nation. We are also incorrectly known as the Navajo Nation. That's, a, um, that's not our real name. That's the name of the Spanish that was many games of telephone later has become Navajo. Um, but we are Diné. We are related to our Nde cousins, also known as Apache. We have... Uh, the Na Dene language group all the way from Alaska down to Northern Mexico. So we're a big uh, interrelated group. Um, and um, my father's mother is from Anadarko, Oklahoma. She's of the Tetzeslis or Cheyenne uh, lineage. My mother's father is of the Ashihe clan of the Dene nation. And my father's father is of the European clan. And I come from Taos, New Mexico originally. And in that manner, I present myself as a Dene woman. And I'm very excited to get into this exciting world of indigenous anthropogenic ecosystems, something that I've been nerding out on for quite a while for the past few years um, in my doctoral studies. I'm not completely finished yet, but pretty close. So um, I would like to go through a series of examples of what this means. You know, what is an anthropogenic foodscape? And what we're gonna find is that indigenous peoples the world over have taken uh, huge landscapes and turned them into incredibly abundant food systems. And they really work with the pre-existing forces of nature that are already there to augment habitat for key species that form the basis of their diet. Uh, we also see that these anthropogenic creations are often thousands and thousands and thousands of years old, um, sort of negating the idea that uh, native peoples didn't have aquaculture or agriculture or domesticated landscapes. You know, we absolutely did. So a lot of this work has huge implications for debunking the primitive Indian myth, uh, which has always been um, just a part of legitimizing the settler state because if settlers could prove that we were primitive, that we were savage, then it didn't really matter that they annihilated us. And if they could prove that we weren't really from here, that we just came across the Bering Strait and haven't been here that long, then they're not really stealing anyone's land. You know, 
because we're also immigrants like them, but that's not true. We've been here for a very, very long time, at least 23,000 years as a recent footprint, a fossilized footprint in New Mexico has, has shown, which is older than the Bering Strait theory. Um, and we've been cultivating and managing this entire continent um, for a very, very long time. We are of this land, uh, this is our home, and as our elders say, we've been here since time immemorial. And so let's get into it. I'm gonna explain my ideas through a series of examples because as indigenous peoples, we are storytellers. So instead of trying to explain it to you with ideas and abstract concepts, I'm just gonna illustrate a few examples of ways in which seven different native nations accomplished this. So, here is my little oh, thingy. Okay, so architects of abundance, indigenous food systems, and the excavation of hidden history. So this little picture is of the Florida riverbanks where people would harvest oysters uh, <laughs> in incredible amounts. And this is a, a artist's rendition of how massive this project was based on the extensive network of shell middens that we find in Florida um, and find all over the US actually. So uh, I'm gonna start with actually an Australian example, um, the Gunditjmara people. This is a 6,000 year old eel farm. They built these rock walls, uh, fish funnels, canals, and holding ponds for the eel uh, that are made of basalt stone. This is a 6,000 year old system. It's right here located in the south um, eastern part of Australia. It's now been turned into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is a woven grass uh, eel funnel. So the eel would swim in here and they catch it on the out, out end. And so their ancestors have been reciprocally harvesting eel from this system for 6,000 years. Um, it's located at Lake Conda, also known as Terak in Victoria, Australia. It's a landscape and bioregional scale, meaning they uh, not just managed a little eel farm, you know, they managed this entire lake system, its tributaries, and the eel are a catadromous aquatic species. This means they live in freshwater, then they go to the ocean to spawn, and then they come back to freshwater to mature, and then back to the ocean to spawn. So on their way back and forth from the ocean to the lake, the Gunditjmara peoples had all these holding ponds that they could have a year round harvest of eel. Uh, and they intensively harvested this eel that they had a very affectionate and still have an affectionate relationship with. Uh, but they managed to do so sustainably as we can see by this thing being 6,000 years old. Okay. <clears throat> There's a high diversity because they're not uh, just created eel habitat, they created habitat for a host of species. Um, and it's a semi-domestication of, of eel, I would say. So the next example is Zuni, Ashiwi um, peoples. And this is probably more familiar to us in the Southwest. Uh, this is a runoff agriculture system. So what they would do is they position their fields at the base of small watersheds. This is not just the Zuni, but also Diné and Hopi and different um, Southwest native nations that managed to turn these deserts into Edens and bread baskets. So what you would do is you would put your cornfield at the base of this watershed so that every monsoon rain, um, that rain would be caught and um, condensed into a, you know, the wash here and would water your field. And this is how they managed to capitalize, although it's not quite the right word, on every single monsoon. And what's really beautiful about this system is that these upland slopes, you know, the mountains where this water will come down from is rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other minerals and nutrients that uh, our crops needed to grow strongly. So with every monsoon rain, you don't just get water, you get an influx of basically fertilizer. 
So these uh, cornfields were continuously planted, one that we know for over a thousand years without depleting the soil. Because when you position it at the base of small watersheds and you maintain the health of those upland soils, you get a massive influx of not just water, but also nutrients every time the monsoons come. And this is a dynamic, um, uh, dynamic system because you can actually, with this little, you know, these little dams here, you can actually um, control how much water comes in and out and uh, sort of work with it because these dams would be made of sagebrush and rock and things that you could easily uh, make denser or thinner. Uh, so very adaptive system. And I have friends who still practice this and they have huge crops every year. So this is uh, anywhere between 1,500 and 3,000 year old system, probably much older, honestly, but we just don't have the capability to date things, uh, date these things yet. Um, and it's, you know, a landscape scale, bioregional. This is not just a little farm. You're working with an entire ecosystem, right? You're working with an entire watershed to create these crops. Anthropogenic, meaning human-made, um, really not just going out and hunting and gathering, but actually co-creating ecosystems. Uh, it's all made of organic, non-synthetic, locally available materials, high biodiversity, as they say, you don't just plant corn for humans, you plant corn for all kinds of animals. Um, and you maintain the biodiversity of the upland soils. And yes, there's a domestication of species. So now I'm gonna go to Kentucky. These are some pictures of chestnut trees. Uh, some of you may know that chestnut formed the strong basis for Appalachian indigenous people. Uh, these women are standing next to a chestnut tree. It's actually in Tennessee, but similar to the ones found in Kentucky. Uh, these guys are standing next to some massive chestnut trees. These are old growth chestnut groves that were managed by indigenous peoples for a very, very long time. So the specific location I want to focus on is a little place called um, Cliff Palace Pond, which people were able to remove some uh, soil sediment cores from a pond. And when you remove a soil core, you can look at the fossilized pollen inside of it. You can look at fossilized uh, or macro fossils like snails or whatever, and you can date all of that. And so what you do is you actually can create, recre reconstruct the, the, the flora that existed around that pond for sometimes tens of thousands of years. So I'm gonna show you a slightly scary graph, but don't worry, I will interpret it for you. Uh, this is the results of the analysis of a, a soil core uh, out of Cliff Palace Pond. This um, leftmost column is time. So this is a thousand years ago, 2000, 3000, et cetera. Uh, each of these black blobs uh, indicate the pollen frequency. So this is looking at fossilized spruce pollen, fossilized cedar pollen, hemlock, oak, chestnut, hickory, black walnut, etc. And what we see is throughout time, the amount of pollen of that specific species uh, that existed in this, in this pond area. So I would like to pay attention to this red line right here, this like 3000 year mark. As you can see, right around 3,000 years ago, let's look at this chestnut area. Uh, no chestnut for a very long time, about 7,000 years, chestnut's not very um, uh, present. And then all of a sudden, 3,000 years ago, you have this huge spike of chestnut pollen. You also have a huge continuous presence of hickory nut. You also have sort of about 2,500 years ago, starting some black walnut pollen coming into the picture. And you see oak, of course, makes a, makes a rebound at that time too. You see the cedar is disappearing here. You see the hemlock kind of disappears too. And so the way that scientists had interpreted this data is that about 3000 years ago, uh, these ancestors, presumably the ancestors of the Shawnee, as this was their traditional homeland, uh, moved in and transformed the forest from a cedar and hemlock forest to a beautiful, food forest, which as we can see, they sustained for 3,000 years. I don't know which one of us has sustained a food system for 3,000 years. Uh, most American systems have collapsed in less than 300 years. 
Um, and what you also see on the very right here is fossilized charcoal. It's very important because it indicates that around 3,000 years ago, you see a very steady, consistent presence of fossilized charcoal. And this actually indicates that the Shawnee ancestors managed these groves with periodic fire, meaning they would burn around the tree. So you eliminate competing vegetation. You transform all the grasses of that season into ash, which creates an influx of potassium, nitrogen, et cetera, into the soil system. It also leaves in its wake nutrient dense grasses that come up after the fire is done. You know, from that ash, as we know, comes nutrient dense grasslands. And who loves that but herbivores like deer, elk, and bison, which were all the way in Kentucky prior to colonization. And so you have your chestnut grove, your black walnut, your hickory nut, and then you have your protein walking around in between. And these would be widely spaced trees. Uh, and when the Americans came and started planting the chestnuts close together, that's when we started to get the blight. And unfortunately, the American chestnut is almost completely eradicated from the United States. Uh, very important for us to take care of this tree and bring it back. So here's a little bit of data points, 3,000 plus years old, bioregional, anthropogenic, biomanaged, high biodiversity, semi-domestication of various species. This is in the Amazon. This is in Bolivia. It's a floodplain aquaculture system. So as you can see here on the left, you have this little funnel, these two earthen walls that were created to funnel fish into this little hole, much like the eel farm. That's called a fish weir. So this was made out of earth. Um, you have here a canal. These are sort of uh, VR renditions that people have created of the Baure uh, floodplain system. Um, you have uh, this artistic rendition where you have the settlement mounds and these canals that would connect these settlements. You have raised fields. You have the fish weirs over here, reservoirs or holding ponds for the fish. And so every time that the waters would come into this system, uh, these, these earthen uh, causeways and these earthen weirs and these earthen canals would catch those waters and funnel the waters where they wanted them. And with those waters, they would funnel fish. What's really interesting about this system is that these raised sort of earthen, just moving earth, creating big um, canals, creating big uh, berms. Uh, on top of those berms, they planted fruit trees. So it's very interesting. These fruit trees were incredibly productive. And you also had uh, the snail habitat, edible escargot. You know, so these people were very refi refined with their escargot um, and fruit trees. And these fruit trees that they would plant were also attracting game animals. So you'd have your fish, you'd have your fruit, you'd have your escargot, and then you'd have maybe whatever uh, game animals you would hunt being attracted to those fruit trees as well. So this was a whole biodiverse food system that was created out of thin air. Um, this is a massive system. This is the country of Bolivia as we know it today. And this Llanos de Mojos, this area in the, in the red circle is the amount of floodplain area that was managed uh, with every rainy season. So it's just incredible how these floodwaters would come in, go into the floodplain, and then as they receded, they would be caught in all of these holding ponds and all the fish would be caught with it. So they'd have a much more extended harvest of fish. So we know that this system is at least a thousand years old. I would guess it's older, frankly. Um, we know that it's a landscape scale system. It's not just a little fish farm, you know, it's like a massive chunk of Bolivia being managed. Uh, the anthropogenic system, you know, without humans, these systems wouldn't have existed in this way. Um, it was made with organic, non-synthetic, locally available materials, which would be the earth that they just moved. They call them the earth movers of Baudis, Bolivia. 
high biodiversity. Like I said, they have, you know, protein, fruit, escargot, all kinds of different species uh, interacting in this food system. And I would say it's a semi-domestication of fish because you kind of catch them and, but they're still kind of flowing in and out naturally with the floodwaters. So now I'm gonna get into fire. Uh, I love fire. I've become a bit of a pyromaniac with this, um, with this research that I've been doing. Um, but so, okay, let's talk about grasslands management in what we now call America. Pyro management, meaning the use of fire to manage these systems. Here's a little quote from a article about the Ozarks. Um, the Illinois Confederacy shaped and altered much of this region as an anthropogenic creation. Like many other indigenous groups in North America, their most important tool was fire. Burning the prairies, they made the grasses hospitable for grazers and managed prairie as a game reserve to maximize productivity. This is a little illustration from Oregon State University. I have no idea how accurate it is, but um, sadly these days, all we can do is imagine because so much of indigenous culture was obliterated by the settler colonial project. Um, but I wanna focus on this sentence here. They made the grasses hospitable for grazers. This is really important because when you burn a prairie, you actually, again, you transform all those dead grasses into, you know, you would burn in the fall, probably for this area when the grasses had kind of had their lifespan and they were dying. And you turn that into ash and that pours an influx of, of minerals into the soil. Because as we know, after fire, there's always this outgrowth of beauty, sort of that metaphorical poetic thing that people say, now, after a forest fire, things regenerate faster with that nutrient dense ash. So indigenous peoples had um, been burning grasses for every year for thousands of years. Now in the wake of this fire, you'd have uh, nutrient dense grasses come up. And so instead of caging the deer or caging the antelope or caging the buffalo, instead we would create habitat for them and they would come to us. So I've been really thinking about it, um, how, oops, I won't go there yet, how um, people say, you know, we followed the buffalo. And I, I just don't think that's true. And it, more and more evidence is coming out saying the buffalo followed our fire because our fire created these grasslands. Now, here's an important note. American grassland habitat is in an endangered state. And it is endangered, I believe, and most authors agree, because indigenous fire has been prohibited. Now, what happens when you stop burning an area that's been burned seasonally for thousands of years? You have the encroachment of shrubs and trees. A lot of the natural places of America that we look out on and see, and see so beautiful are actually nothing like what they used to be. And in a way, they're not natural at all because by not burning, these systems get really crowded. You have hundreds of trees on an acre fighting for limited sunlight, nutrients, and water. And what indigenous peoples would do, they would burn to sort of push and suppress the, the, the shrubs and the trees from overgrowing and open up canopy, uh, open up space for not just humans to travel, but animals to travel. They would create these biodiverse grasslands that were pyro adapted. And so, Without indigenous fire management, much of the American grassland habitat has collapsed into shrubland or forest land. So that's a little thing to know. Um, this is a lunar calendar by the Miamia Nation, who is indigenous to what we now call the Ohio River Valley. And their September moon is called the grass burning moon. And this is a little picture from their website, one of their burns. Uh, the grass burning moon is correlates with our Gregorian September. So you can see that fire was so important to the Miamia nation as well as many other indigenous nations that they actually dedicated an entire month to be named for that time when we burn. Um, and some really interesting stuff actually. Uh, so this is from the Miamia uh, publication. I'm going to say this wrong. I apologize to all my Miami relatives. In Sasakoilia, 
Kilswa, we see fire as something that restores and gives new life to the prairie. Fire helps clear the land of old grass and brush and opens seed pods that have fallen to the ground. Because of fire, new flowers and plants emerge in the spring. This is an excellent book on the left called Forgotten Fires. It literally goes state by state in the entire United States with an exhaustive amount of citations of early explorers, um, soldiers, anything that this guy could get his hands on talking about how native people would burn the land. And every single part of this continent from the Florida Everglades to the Ozark, to the Ozarks, to the New England forests, to the Great Plains, to the California forests, uh, to even to the deserts where we would burn to stimulate amaranth growth. This entire, the Pacific Northwest, and that every single corner of this continent was fire managed by indigenous people. And this is a little picture of um, Texas with some bison back before it was turned into a cattle ranch. And um, this was a fire managed area. So, okay, I'm gonna keep going. Got two more for you. Hopefully I can finish. Um, feel free to send me a chat if I'm going over time. I haven't been keeping track. Um, so I'm gonna talk about cane really quick. I got two more examples. So the cane is an indigenous bamboo species. Hold on one second. Let me tell Mr. Boo. Mr. Boo, no, no. So um, the cane is an indigenous bamboo species, and it used to grow throughout the Southeast, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee. And this plant um, was used by indigenous peoples for all kinds of things. Um, it was used to make baskets, arrows, flutes. Uh, this is all cane break. Uh, basketry, beautiful stuff. Um, and this plant was actually human dependent and disturbance dependent. What does that mean? That means cane without disturbance, without a fire or a flood or something. It will get all thick like this guy with the horse and it will collapse into itself. It will become over competitive. It'll soak up all the nutrients and water out of the soil and it will collapse into itself. So wherever you see cane, you know that anthropogenic fire was there. Wherever you see cane, either a flood or in this case, native people would burn it over and over and over to open up the canopy. And whenever you burn one of these canes, more will grow in its wake. So it's one of those things like whenever you hit it, it just grows back stronger. And this is really important for the food system of the American South uh, because you actually would create bison forage. Now, most people don't think about the South being bison habitat, but this map is called the bison belt. And you can see that uh, this plains bison, this dark brown uh, shade is uh, known to have been all the way down to the Florida panhandle throughout Georgia, throughout Alabama, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Kentucky. Bison were all throughout the South actually. Um, and many of the tribes here, the Muscogee in particular that I know of have bison songs, bison um, materials that they use. And so human fire, uh, river cane or giant cane, you know, this indigenous bamboo species and buffalo had a very unique trifecta uh, relationship where the humans would burn the cane, the cane would grow back with more vigor, the bison would eat it, the bison would deposit their um, feces <laughs> onto the ecosystem, and then it would nourish the cane, and then the cane would grow even bigger, the humans would burn it, etc. And so settlers, when they would come into the south and they saw a huge bamboo stand, they knew that the soil was very fertile there. And much of the cotton industry overtook the river cane and the giant cane habitat. 
such that the, the, the cane habitat in the Southeast United States is about 2% what it used to be. It's been destroyed by about 98%, which perhaps not coincidentally is also how much native populations have been reduced. So sometimes when you kill the species, you kill the people with it. And so the cane and indigenous peoples and the buffalo had a very beautiful relationship back in the day. And there are those who are trying to restore it in the South today. The last thing I'll talk about is the Heltzuk people, uh, the British Columbia coastal region, right above Vancouver, as you can see here. These folks are amazing. I've had the great pleasure of visiting them and they specialize in what I will call herring row farming. Now, what is that? This guy here is actually harvesting the eggs of the herring, which are sticking to this uh, material that he put in there a few days prior. This is the herring on the left when they spawn. The whole coast turns milky white. And this young man is holding up hemlock branches. So herring on hemlock is a delicacy because the herring eggs start to uh, soak up the natural aroma of the hemlock, which is a type of like evergreen. And herring on hemlock together is delicious. And they actually can sell it on the international market for a hefty price because it's such an international delicacy. They also have something called spawn on kelp, which is herring, but instead of on hemlock, it's on kelp. So these folks are farming herring roe by placing these um, kelp into the water held up by ropes. And mind you, their ancestors have been doing this for thousands of years. This is not like a new thing. And then the herring will plaster every square inch of this kelp with their eggs. And you get this little dish on the bottom right called spawn on kelp. Now, these folks have been creating this for hundreds of years. And what they do single-handedly is they augment herring habitat. And mind you, these eggs are not just eaten by humans. They're eaten by wolves, salmon, killer whales up the food chain, sea lions. So the point of this food system is not just to feed humans, but to feed the entire food web. And just by creating an added, uh, um, what would you call it? They call it substrate, but a better word that's more understandable is um, uh, surface area. They add surface area into the coastal areas such that the herring have more habitat to lay their eggs. So they're helping the herring, they're helping themselves because they get to eat this delicious eggs, they're helping the salmon. And what's beautiful about this system is there's always enough eggs left behind so that they can hatch and the herring can come back again next February. So they call it herring season and their new year starts when the herring come. That's how important the herring are to these people. So we'll just take a quick look, some takeaways. Uh, a lot of this is about habitat expansion. As you can see everything from the expansion of grasslands to the expansion of eel habitat, et cetera, as a form of food systems management. In other words, instead of caging chickens, why don't we just build habitat that chickens like and they will come to us. And maintaining those habitats is an important part of that. You could, these people manage to steward these habitats without destroying them. Uh, mostly all of them are over a thousand years old. So reciprocity is another important element of these systems. Reciprocity means that you don't just eat the eel, you make sure that the eel have a place to live. You make sure that the eel are safe. And I didn't get to share a lot of the quotes from the Gunditjmara people, but they have a deep love for these eel. The eel are them and they are the eel. And so it's important for us to think about not just what we can get from our food, but what we can give to the beings that give their life so that we can eat and have our own life. Um, holistic management is another uh, element of these types of food systems where you're not just doing a little oyster farm, right? You're managing an entire estuary. 
and then you're managing the fish that interact with those oysters. You're not siloing, you're not compartmentalizing, you are honoring the whole system. And that also means in the case of like an oyster estuary management, which the Chesapeake Bay, by the way, um, Algonquin people have been harvesting oysters out of Chesapeake Bay for over 6,000 years. <laughs> and under American management, the Chesapeake oyster population has almost completely been depleted. But um, for example, with the estuary management, you, not, you don't just need to manage that estuary, right? You need to make sure that the rivers that feed that estuary are clean or else your oysters are gonna have a hard time. So it's holistic management. You're thinking about the entire web of relationships, which as we see with the Barre floodplain fishery can be massively huge. So that leads us to landscape scale. You know, this is a landscape scale food system. This is not a little garden. We didn't just plant gardens. We planted whole forests. We managed whole grasslands. We managed the Great Plains. Um, it's really important to know how, how massive these food systems were. They are mostly all millennial scale. As I said, they're all usually at least a thousand years old. I say consent and free will based because we didn't cage things. You know, we created a home for things. There's a difference. Uh, lastly, there's a stewardship mentality. This belief that as indigenous peoples, we were placed here by creator to steward a land, not just for ourselves, but for others. We are warriors for life that is non-human. We were given these big brains and we were chosen by creator to be the caretakers of a land and the protectors of a land. That's very different than a farmer, right? Who owns this land and they're gonna farm it. They're gonna extract from it. They're gonna get something from it. That's completely flipped around where we are in service to the land. So my recommendations is that we create these regional food shed cooperatives where we're not just you know, doing little plots of soybeans here and little plot of almonds over here, but really looking holistically at a whole watershed um, and seeing what indigenous species were there. So DNA and ancestral diet base, you, know, you really have to realize that we, what nourishes me will not necessarily nourish a person from Africa. What will nourish a person from Africa will not necessarily nourish a person from Norway, and on and on and on. We all evolved for tens of thousands of years in a unique biome, and many of us have DNA that is adapted to those types of meats, plants, even down to the water. Some of our DNA is adapted to specific watersheds and the minerals that are present in those watersheds. So it's incredible how, how tailored these food systems are. Uh, I think we should do pilot projects. Obviously, it's hard to go from the food system we have today to the food systems I'm outlining here. But if we can do small pilot projects, we can see if they work and expand and scale up from there. And of course, land back, which is we can't manage these food systems unless the US government gives us uh, decision making power over these land bases. So really, I'm a proponent of land back and getting large swaths of land back in the hands of indigenous people to know how to manage them. So uh, finally, I just wanna say that Turtle Island, you know, what we call this land uh, is not, it's a densely populated, extensively managed continent. It's not a few scraggly Indians running around eating hands and mouth, trying to eke out a living on the land. No, we were architects of abundance. We lived in great abundance and we had a lot of space to really cultivate the food bearing capacity of the land on immense and impressive scales. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So thank you all for your time and we'll go to questions now. I suppose I should unmute myself there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lila. That was uh, incredible. We're getting great comments uh, coming in from folks both uh, on the webinar and on Facebook. Uh, and I'll, I'll turn to a couple of questions that they've got. Um, first of all, uh, we've got a question from Stephen asking about the uh, irrigation techniques around Zuni and wondering if there's much evidence for the use of canals 
uh, or if there's any remnants of canals in the area around Zuni? Well, Stephen, that's exactly the point is they worked with the canals that were already in nature, if you will. Instead of creating canals, they worked with the pre-existing topography of the area. A food shed, or rather a watershed, is its own canal. So you would place your fields in proper place. And what's interesting about the Zuni floodplain agriculture is you can't use too big of a watershed. Because if you get too big of a watershed, it's going to flood out your plants and they're going to get uprooted. So what's really unique about this is it has to be the right size of watershed. Um, having said that, I know there was the Zuni waffle gardens, of course, are very famous, right? So those are kind of like little um, holding ponds for the, the water. So they would create little um, like divots where they would plant the seed and those were the waffle gardens. Uh, and so I think there were probably ditches within these small fields. I'm unfortunately not able to answer that question with complete confidence, but I would imagine that in addition to the watershed, which was its own ditch and its own canal, that's the whole point, right? Is going to where nature's already doing its thing. Instead of uh, siphoning the water to somewhere else, why don't we respect where the water wants to be and, and go and dovetail the forces of nature that are already present? Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's the best I can answer that question. Thanks for that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that is one of the things that I think is so cool about some of the agricultural techniques in the Southwest is the way that they are so well fitted to specific environmental niches, like finding that exact spot where the things come together in just the right way so that agriculture works in that spot. I think there might have been an archaeology project near Zuni that did identify canals, but they, and they were really old. They were like three or four thousand years old, I want to say, um, from an earlier method of agriculture in that area. It's some of the oldest agriculture I think they know of in that that area. Um, I've got a question uh, from someone here asking about uh, cane in the southeast. Uh, when cotton replaced cane, what kind of impact might this have had on the soil? <laughs> um, well, uh, cane has a way of not needing outside fertilizer because when you're burning it, it's constantly getting recycled. Uh, and when the animals are there and the defecating in the area, it's, it's this whole nutrient cycle that's constantly being replenished into the soil. With cotton, it's more extractive, right? Like you plant the seeds, you get the cotton. And so that's when they started to do a lot of imported fertilization. Um, and the cotton fields um, to this day uh, have a huge intake of fossil uh, fertilizing. And interestingly, this affected the um, horseshoe crab population because when settlers first came, they noticed how the um, Chesapeake Bay people and the coastal people, the Atlantic coast people were using the horseshoe crabs for fertilizing their fields. They, these are very ancient species, right? They look like a living fossil. It's very precious, very beautiful. And um, there's sadly pictures of, kind of like how you see the buffalo skulls in these huge mountains, the way they would destroy buffalo populations. So too do you see pictures of horseshoe crabs by the millions just stacked on top of each other being shipped off to places like Alabama, Mississippi, Kansas, Oklahoma, um, to actually fertilize um, this, these, these extractive crop industries. So it definitely, to this day, the, the, the ecosystem of the cotton industry depends on outside, outside fertilizers. So that's one way I can think. Another way I can think is that a huge function of cane, although I have to admit I'm not an expert, although I'm a completely obsessed with it, I'm not an expert. A huge function of cane is to stabilize soil systems. You have to understand that the South is a very wet place. It rains at least once a week. And when it rains, it rains. And so the cane would help to stabilize soil systems. Uh, I'm sure they had a lot of different things that they did to help the soil. Unfortunately, I don't know all what that is, but those are two things that I can think of is that they help to recycle nutrients through the constant fire uh, of the cane breaks. 
and they also helped to stabilize the soil system in a place that was very uh, high precipitation. Oh, thanks for the thanks for the answer there. Um, got a question coming in from from Kate Thompson. Uh, does a practice of burning in the Southwest work to propagate native seeds when water is so limited? Uh, so in these arid environments, like where we are here in Southwest Colorado or New Mexico, Arizona, um, are the nutrients going to cycle in a similar way as burning in grassland environments uh, in, in, in the Midwest and, and areas where, where tall grass prairies existed? So um, this is a huge, uh, another obsession of mine, and it, there's some controversy around the correct answer to this question, but there's a, quite a few people who are really um, believing that amaranth, uh, and, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but chinopodium, chinopods, uh, were, which were a huge part of the Southwest diet. Uh, as Diné people, our elders say it was more important than corn in terms of, I mean, you can't really rank amaranth and corn, they're both incredibly important. But um, in terms of perhaps volume, you know, amaranth was a really important food staple for the Southwest. And this is a pyro adapted species. It, it does well after fire. So obviously it's different than the grasslands of the Midwest and the Great Plains. But um, I do know also that a lot of different peoples will burn their cornfields before planting. They'll burn whatever um, crop residues they have to put those nutrients back into the into the into the field before they plant their corn. Um, also, you know, the Southwest is a very large area, and not all of it is deserty. Uh, you have the Jemez Mountains, which have a very um, strong record of anthropogenic fire. For the past thousands of years, uh, Jemez peoples would manage the Jemez mountains with fire um, very, very intensely. Um, also, I have a huge paper that I'm writing uh, advocating for the idea that Diné people or whoever was in the Chusca mountains um, were managing that with fire as well. And so I think, you know, the Southwest, the more deserty, arid areas, I think. It's, it's kind of up for debate, but I think the amaranth and other edible species actually did do very well after fire um, and uh, arguably made up a larger part of the diet of Southwest peoples than even than corn. Um, and there's also evidence around Mesa Verde that people did routine fire uh, in the lowlands there. Um, and so, yeah, I think fire played a much greater role in the Southwest than uh, people afford it. If you look at these sagebrush, these oceans of sagebrush, I don't necessarily think that those are natural or healthy. I think that those could have been mitigated with fire to create a more biodiverse system. Um, furthermore, there is some speculation that the pinyon juniper uh, sort of, you know, picturesque southwest is, is actually more uh, uh, a relic of indigenous fire prohibition. That in other words, it's, 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 it's a result of fire being prohibited near Gallup, near uh, Grant, et cetera, rather than a natural ecosystem. So it's a very interesting discussion in the literature right now about it. Do you think that here in the Southwest where maize agriculture has been such an important part of the food system, and it's certainly been a huge focus for anthropologists uh, thinking about how people's lived in this place. Do you think that we've, well, Europeans love to put things in categories. And so there's agriculture and domestication, and then there's sort of things that are not domesticated and maybe cultivated. Being in the Southwest with so much maize agriculture, do you think we're overlooking a lot of these ways that people worked uh, with plant species um, in these sort of cultivated or semi-domesticated settings? Absolutely. I think that's actually part of my thesis with my doctoral work is we shouldn't pigeonhole indigenous peoples as either, you know, corn growers, agri agriculturalists, or on the other extreme, hunter gatherers. Uh, a lot of Southwest peoples were in the middle. You know, they had whole domesticated landscapes. They had, for instance, the Chuska Mountain, I argue, 
was not just fire managed, but fire managed to create more forage for the antelope, the, the mountain sheep, um, and the uh, various herbivores that we would hunt. And so, you know, that's, that's a semi-domesticated landscape. That's a humanized landscape. So I think corn has stolen the show in a lot of ways. Uh, and of course, corn is very important. It's very sacred, and it, it's, it's foundational to our food system. Uh, but I don't think it was um, the 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 only the the greatest food staple by volume by any means. I think uh, a lot of the the landscapes that we cultivated were producing more volume of food in the form of amaranth and things like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna. Well, here's an interesting question. Um, I like this one. Uh, do you see a way for sustainably managed ecosystems, land stewardship, the kind of examples that you've been giving, uh, do you see a way for that to be compatible with the Western and colonial idea of land ownership? That, not, not, not very much actually, because again, these are holistic systems. Uh, anyone who's been on an airplane, when you look down, you see little squares, right? Squares of Joe's doing this over here, Jack's doing that over here, and this guy uses this fertilizer and this person. And so they're not able to capitalize, that's the wrong word again, on the, the whole system and what the whole system does. For example, like a, a floodplain management, you need to be able to manage whole floodplains. You can't have them segmented into little 10 acre plots. You need to work together. And so I think the uh, collective co-ownership of land by indigenous peoples really served them very well. Um, and it helps them to, to harness whole uh, natural forces. Another example is the clam garden in the Pacific Northwest. They would build intertidal rock walls some were 15 kilometers long that would catch water and sediment as the tide receded and would augment clam habitat in that sort of intertidal zone. So these rock walls would actually catch and create calmer waters where the clams could proliferate. Now, if you have every little bit of the shoreline, you know, beachfront property divided up into little pieces and sold on Zillow, you're not going to be able to create that kind of contigu contiguous clam habitat. And so I think that's a great question. Um, I wish it could be because then we could get started on this sooner. Um, but that's why I'm advocating for, you know, food sheds, cooperatives, for us to at least start small and have 10 neighbors who live in the same area say, hey, let's work together. How can we work with the system that's around us? Um, but ideally, we'd be more like indigenous peoples in the past who were managing entire tributaries, entire sets of tributaries, um, and working with other tribes to, to co-manage all along the watershed. Well, the scale of these systems that you're describing is, is incredible. Like when entire regions being managed under a particular regime, um, and would you say that this, the fact that these are so large and continue for so many generations, is that a result of this kind of relational reciprocal um, approach to being in a place? Does that allow them to thrive at this scale? You know, I, I wish I could answer that better. Uh, a lot of these systems have been very profoundly disrupted. Uh, the Shumash, for example, the Shumash of the Channel Islands, they were um, fishing shellfish for 10,000 years in the Channel Islands. They were hunting sea otters for at least 6,000 years. We know this from the archaeological record. They were working with kelp forests for at least 3,000 years. And so the Shumash had this huge Channel Island ecosystem, and they were there for at least 11,000 years that we know of. Um, and so I do know that they created a highly complex social political system. Do I know the nuances of that social political system? Unfortunately not, because the vast majority of our Shumash relatives were obliterated with disease. 
Although many of them are still surviving and resilient and strong and honoring their ancestors still today, but a lot of the nuances of how to coexist and work together are encoded in indigenous languages, encoded in our indigenous worldviews. And that's why it's so important, not just to protect these food systems, but to protect the languages and the worldviews and the cultures that take care of them and, and have the encoded knowledge to actually enact them. So I would say yes to your question, although we really need to consult with indigenous peoples on a place by place basis to really understand that. Well, that raises another interesting question for me, thinking about language being such a critical factor in how some of these ecosystems are, um, are managed and lived with. Uh, what are some of the ways that people have passed this knowledge on and how is it being passed on today? I mean, you have over 573 federally recognized tribes in the U.S. alone. You have 200 more that are not federally recognized. And that's after 98% of us were obliterated by the process of colonization. So you have about 800 tribes still living and that's after 98% of us were obliterated. So you probably can times that by 50. Uh, so you probably have like 1600 indigenous nations going on here or rather 16,000, sorry, that used to be here. So there's no one answer for your question. There's so many, there's so much diversity amongst the indigenous nations, but I can just say from my own nation that we tell our stories to our children and we tell them during the winter time and we tell these stories to pass on to them the knowledge of how to take care of the earth, how to be a good person. And I will say that one of the key ingredients for making these systems work is to instill in the next generation the value of generosity. Generosity is the linchpin that keeps indigenous systems thriving in the manner that they do. Like for my womanhood ceremony, I had to bake a corn cake that was this big. It took me four days to make it and I couldn't have a single bite. So that's one way that the womanhood ceremony passes on this ethic of generosity and selflessness. And when you have an entire nation where everyone's competing for who could be the most generous, who could be the most selfless, who could be the most humble, your society manifests much differently. And you actually have, ironically, much more wealth uh, for the collective to share. Seems like a fundamentally different way of looking at the world than those of us who've grown up in capitalism, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I'm going to I'm going to combine a couple of questions here, um, sort of generalize them a little bit, uh, and just ask what can you give examples of some of the current revitalization efforts that are going on around the country? Are there groups of people who are working to bring back some of these ecosystems? I know that a lot of the examples you've given include this, but a lot of folks just want to know, where can I go to find out more about efforts to bring back these particular kinds of ecosystems? Yeah, there's, there's quite a number of um, groups. Uh, there's one that sticks out to me in particular in Alabama, where the Muscogee people, a faction of them anyways, have recently um, come under stewardship of over 700 acres of land in central Alabama. And they have brought back sturgeon to this area, which has been extirpated uh, over a hundred years ago. They are protecting the long leaf montane pine. Um, and they are protecting a number of other species, including cane. They're trying to augment the river cane habitat um, and really taking care of that land in, in, a, in the old way. They recently burned, I think over a hundred acres of that land base um, to really bring fire back to the land. Uh, I will say, unfortunately, particularly in the United States, it's not so bad in Canada or Mexico, not so bad in South America, but a lot of our knowledge has been really, really fragmented here. Sadly, when I look for case studies, it's really hard to find them in the US in terms of people who still know 
the nuances and the language and the worldview and the stories. Um, a lot of this stuff we're relying on white archaeologists to tell the story when we don't have any elders to interview anymore because either they're all dead from disease epidemics or massacre or the ones who are still alive went through the boarding school process and don't remember. They don't remember how we used to do these things. They don't remember um, different things. But that's not to say that the knowledge is completely extinct. It's still surviving in small oases throughout the United States. Um, but the US government did a pretty good job of obliterating our library of knowledge through the prohibition of our languages in the boarding schools. Um, but there's also another example, for example, the Segorite Land Trust in the Bay Area has just been uh, received some land in the Bay Area that they're trying to bring back the trout to Oakland, you know, the Oakland rivers. <laughs> uh, it's amazing, you know, and I find that wherever indigenous peoples have autonomy over their ancestral land, these systems start to thrive again. And so I can't be more of a stronger proponent for land back because when you give land back to indigenous peoples, you're not just rematriating land, you're rematriating entire ecosystems that, um, that really deserve to be rehabilitated. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for coming and speaking with us today and sharing your knowledge. Uh, I've hosted a lot of these webinars and the feedback that we're getting from folks, they have really enjoyed this. <laughs> this has been one of the favorite ones that they've seen in a long time. Uh, I want to give you one more chance if you've got anything that you want to add before we, uh, we think about signing off here. Well, I just want to thank you very much for this time to try and, you know, explain these ideas. And I think that uh, there's many different reasons for this research, uh, why it's important. One is to correct the, the narrative, right? Correct the historical record and say, no, uh, this was not terra nullius, you know? This, which in Latin means no man's land, uh, which is what many of the explorers uh, had, had reported back to their kings and queens. They said it was terra nullia, meaning no man's land. You know, and what few natives were there were savage and you know, nomads, and it just couldn't be further from the truth. So correcting that historical record and saying, no, this was a highly cultivated land, and we were highly cultivated people, highly sophisticated, arguably much more sophisticated than our counterparts uh, who had been in 2000 years of open warfare in Europe and were pretty ragged at the time. They were having a hard time. And so um, uh, there's that, you know, to correct the record. Uh, the other reason that this research is important, I think, is because it shows us, hey, if people did this in the past, that means we can do it again. And that gives us a lot of hope and excitement because these food systems feed two birds with one scone. They not just feed humans, they augment biodiversity. And those are two things we really need right now. We need for humans to have a stable food source and we need to augment biodiversity now more than ever. And so it shows us that this has been done before. It can be done again. And to that point, I will say it's not just enough to mimic indigenous systems. We have to restore decision-making power to indigenous nations themselves. Um, it is okay to mimic and we should mimic, but we should be also restoring land to indigenous peoples uh, equally, if not more, as, as we mimic uh, their practices. Oh, that's a great message to end on here. So Lila June, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon, this evening. Um, I look forward to seeing what comes out of your doctoral research. And this has just been really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I have uh, lilajune.com. If you want to look at my website, I'm on all the social things, except for TikTok. I'm apparently too old for that. I can't figure it out. I, just, I try and I just, I can't. But I have like Instagram and Facebook, the old people social media. I have it. So you can check me out there and a YouTube channel with all that different discussions as well. So thank you all for your time.